What is going on in the Psalms is really what is going on when we take up our hymn book. And although our hymn book is not inspired, we're, we're singing things that wash over our souls. And it doesn't mean that at the end of singing the song that anything's changed necessarily. It's just washed over our soul. It's just reminded us of, of where our hope is. It doesn't automatically change anything. It just um, drives us back to what we know to be our hope. And even the things that are unspoken here that some of you dear folk are carrying, I think we're ministered to uh, by those songs. So one of the challenges of the Psalms is it is a song. Uh, they are songs. It's not like taking Ephesians chapter one and exegeting, expositing, trying to figure out all the parts and pieces of that. That's not what a Psalm is for. A, a Psalm is worship material. And so what you get is you get themes that are repeated. Sometimes they're memorable things. If you were a Hebrew and I read through Psalm number 37, you would pick up on the fact that every other verse starts with a Hebrew letter. And so it would, it would serve you for memory. It would serve me for memory. Like Psalm 119, every eight verse section is a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet so we can remember it, so, so we can bring it back. I find myself often humming a tune or singing a song and then only later to realize whatever was going through my mind that I was thinking about is in some way connected to the song that came to mind because from the earliest age I was exposed and many of you have been exposed to to Christian music, to godly truth. Uh, one of the great blessings of our generation has been Ron Hamilton and the fact that this man in going through a difficulty surrendered to that difficulty and spent his life with his wife creating music that's full of biblical content and though it was specifically aimed toward children in a lot of the context, it brought forth fundamental truths that all of us need to be reminded of. Now they're in a, a very deep, difficult time as he is suffering from what his father suffered from and, and basically is unable to function until you start singing music. You can actually see him wor singing the words to those songs. So even in this hour, a difficult time for he and Shelley, uh, truth that he has digested is ministering to his soul. That's what the Psalms are about. And in returning to Psalm 37 this afternoon, I'm doing so for a singular purpose, and that is to try to help you and to help me just kind of put our antennas up and say, okay, what is the psalmist doing here? There are at least eight admonitions here. And so uh, as I was looking at these and realizing you could put more, uh, they're not... Uh, in, in any, they're not in any particular way undoing what is said in another place, and some of them are repetitious. I thought about the idea of recalibrating our souls, and I began to think about that in terms of what has to happen often for me, and that is, uh, and I hear from you as well, is to go to um, to the Word of God and allow it to calibrate our souls or recalibrate our souls. Uh, to calibrate just in, in a word picture for you is to determine the caliber of a ball from its weight. You guys that do the black powder thing. Uh, the caliber is the weight of that, of that ball. And so uh, when we talk about handguns and we talk about uh, shotguns, we got gauge, 12 gauge, 20 gauge. We talk about a 44 or a nine millimeter or something. We're talking about a caliber, which basically means there is, there, there is a standard. There's a standard. And so to calibrate is to go and look at that standard, to fix and check and, and correct by that standard that has been established. It has to do with using a uniform established standard as a guide. So the calibration is the process of checking the caliber by an established standard. And originally, again, it was the weight of a ball. So a recalibrated life, the way I'm thinking this afternoon, just trying to cement something in your mind that you can take with you, would be a life that's regularly weighed. You remember that New Testament word worthy? Remember that's a, a merchandise term? And we don't do this anymore, but in the old days, you go into a store and they'd have a set of scales there. And if they were honest, they'd put, you know, half a pound over here and then they load this side down with a half a pound. And, and, and when it was when it was even, it was worthy. 
That's, that means this matches this. And so a, a worthy walk, a worthy life in the New Testament sense is something that matches who we are in Christ. This is who Christ is. And Paul always turns from that point and says, now walk a worthy, a, a worthy walk. You walk a life that balances, that fits with who you are in Christ. You, you walk a life that fits with what Christ has done for you. So a recalibrated life is a, a, a life that's regularly weighed, it's checked, it's measured by a divine standard. It is in New Testament terms, a worthy life. Uh, one that's weighed in the balance and one that then is adjusted. Okay, it's adjusted. You look at the standard, you take up the word of God and you look at what it says and, and you see, okay, here's the standard. And you're looking at your life and, and you're, you're before God, you're seeking to bring your life into alignment with that standard. Folks, that actually goes on every day. If you're in the word of God, it should be going on every day. You should be asking the Lord to show you about himself to show you who he is and what he's done in your, in, for you and then to bring your life into adjustment. And so when I take up Psalm 37, when you take up Psalm 37 and we see these eight or more admonitions that serve as standards, they serve as standards, not so we can say, oh, that's nice. And I'd like for that to be true sometime. No, it's so I can recalibrate my life to see that. And what happens more often than not is I find out and you find out I didn't think I was fretful, but I am. See, somebody says fret not to me and they were well, not fretful. And I take up the word of God and I go, well, maybe I am. My wife would say, you certainly are. Right. And why didn't you sleep last night? Well, um, um, <laughs> Um, and she's very gracious. She doesn't say because you're fretful. But you take up the word of God. You look at these things and you say, well, guilty as charged. And then you set about to fix it. How are you doing with that? I'm not go fret anymore. That's what I did last night. And I don't fret anymore. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing because you're walking with me and you're going, yeah, I'm going to put that out of my mind. There's a lost son out there. Maybe your situation. There's a there's a a, a, a physical challenge. You, you fill it all in. You pick up the word of God, and the word of God says, "Fret not thyself." And then, okay, fret not yourself because of evildoers. And there's a sense in which we can say, okay, so you know what is really going on in my soul. And so I want to look at these admonitions with you. This afternoon, and I'm going to ask you, uh, because I'm going to zoom through them. Uh, you can just mark them. You can make a note. Just, you can just put the verse down if you want to. But ask you to take them up and begin to give thought to them. Wednesday night, I shifted directions, and I was going to go to Philemon. And about three hours before the service, I asked Lord to print some blank sheets for notes because... Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you was something that was on my heart and I knew had to be on the hearts of some of the people here and that the Lord cares for us. And so this kind of comes in alongside of that, this idea of being careful for nothing, but in everything am I in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, making my request known unto the Lord. And sometimes the answer to that's no. Because I'm a fixer. Some of you are fixers. And fixers are fretters because fixers fret because they realize they can't fix it. And so there are New Testament texts, there's Old Testament text, there's scenarios that each of us come from and are dealing with presently. And I'm asking that we just think in terms of recalibrating. Uh, in accordance with the word of God. This would be the goal. Okay. First verse of, ver of 37, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. The first admonition is fret not, neither be envious. Fret not, neither be envious. Do not upset yourself with evildoers and do not envy those who do wrong. Why can't I have it that easy? Why can't my life be that normal? They seem to prosper. They seem to get ahead. They seem to exceed. Why shouldn't I? 
their prosperity and their pleasure and their good times, the Bible says for us in verse number two, are short-lived and will end abruptly and will end eternally. So this first admonition, this first guideline or standard by which to measure our lives is to not get heated up because of the evil around us. A fuming or becoming vexed, even in the text, a flame of jealousy. And this is very possible in times of adversity. We want to say, what's the use? What's the point of living righteously? Well, God's answer to that, the, the, the answer to what's the use is because that's going to end in a very swift and devastating final judgment. You don't want to be there. So I ask you and I ask me, how are we doing with this one? Will we listen to the Lord? Will we recalibrate our lives and say, by God's grace, I'm going to take that with me and I'm going to look at that standard and I'm going to say, where am I? How am I doing with this agitation within that the Bible clearly says is not to be part of my life? Second one, admonition number two is in verse three. Trust in the Lord and do good. I think these progress. Stop fretting. Stop being envious. Do this instead. You trust in the Lord and you do good. You stop being envious of people that are doing evil and you trust in the Lord and do good. This is the second admonition. Taking our lead from the visible is forbidden. That which is apparent that's forbidden, but turning our hope to the invisible, to the reality, to Jehovah and doing what is good. Faith cures fretting. Faith, as one writes, has clearer optics. Faith has clearer optics to behold things as they really are. And doing good is a fine remedy for jealousy of evildoers. Doing good is a fine remedy for jealousy of evil. What should I do if I'm jealous of evildoers? Do good, he says. Do good. There's a joy in holy activity which drives away this rust of discontentment. Admonition number three is in verse four, and you see it readily, and that is delight thyself also in the Lord. And I think we are progressing Fret not, neither be envious. Trust in the Lord, do good. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. Find pleasure in Yahweh. I thought of this much when I read through the Psalms. I thought, you know, I'm to find pleasure in Yahweh, and Yahweh is to find pleasure in me. And that's strange that Yahweh does find pleasure in his children. Finds pleasure in the testimony of him having his way in our lives. Take delight in the Lord. That's another step forward, isn't it? That's another soul adjustment. Okay, stop fretting. Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Bring your passions in alignment with the Lord's. Make Jehovah the joy of your life. And he will give you, it says, your heart's desires because they're in alignment with his. I think the people we work with need to see this. The people we work with need to see that we are delighting ourselves in the Lord, that our lives are lives of joy and rejoicing because we find our delight in him. Admonition number four, verse number five, commit thy way into the Lord. Trust also in him. Commit thy way into the Lord. This is another progression. Roll your way to Jehovah. Roll the whole burden of life upon the Lord. Cast your care upon him, for he careth for you. Leave with Yahweh. Leave with Yahweh. Not only your present fretfulness, but all your cares. Do not live a care-filled existence. Cast away all anxiety. Submit all of your life to him. Resign your will to his will. Leave everything with him. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. What is that? The way he has for you. Verse number six says, your rightness, that kind of life will become apparent to all because he's going to bring forth thy righteousness as the light. 
and thy judgment as the noonday. Your choices regarding right and wrong will be vindicated. Your hoping in God will prove the truth. The vindication of the disparities of life, a resolving of the tensions of life is all wrapped up in this psalm of praise. Admonition number five, you've already seen it because you went one more verse and see, there it is. Number five, rest. Well, that's part of the progression. Fret not, neither be envious. Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Commit thy way to the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. The idea is we've studied it. Be still. <laughs> be still. And once again, there's more than me in this room that has a hard time being still. It, it, it has to do with stopping your mouth and stopping your action. Be quiet. Stop trying to fix it. Be quiet. Be still before Yahweh. Wait with keen anticipation for him to move. How much frustration? Go back to number one. How much frustrating and fretting comes because we will not leave it with Jehovah. We just won't. And we're such a verbal society. My insides get so stirred sometimes I just have to walk away. So to walk away, the endless chatter. And I'll try not to be offensive when I do it, but when there's endless chatter about things we don't know anything about, you might, want, you might watch me slide somewhere else. It just disrupts my soul. I, think, I don't understand the purpose of it. And I think part of the answer is we need to be quiet and we need to be still. And we just sit before Yahweh, be still before Yahweh, wait with keen anticipation for him. Hush your spirit, renounce all self-help, submit to his will, put off the tension by looking to him and hoping in him. One writer states, time is nothing to him. Let it be nothing to thee. I think that's Spurgeon probably. Time is nothing to him. Let it be nothing to thee. Our problem is we want to tell God when to do what we're asking him to do. And if he doesn't fix it now, we become very frustrated. If he doesn't fix it in five years, we become very frustrated. We may go to the grave frustrated because he hasn't fixed it yet. And he says, would you be quiet? Silence and quietness of posture I call it this morning a righteous resignation, hushing our spirit, renouncing all self-help, submitting to his will, putting away the tension, and allowing the Lord to settle our souls. Number six, next verse, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Give it up. Refrain, refrain from anger. Give up your rage. Do not be incensed. It leads only to evil doing. Aggravation, internal strain, emotional seething, all of these are here. At this point, the psalmist, under the guidance of God's spirit, just seems to, to move off list and begins to visit with us or leads us in our worship by branching out from here all the way through verse number 26. After he says, cease from anger and forsake wrath, he says, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. It's like he goes back and picks up the thread from verse number one. And then he branches out and he says, listen, evildoers shall be cut off, verse nine. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place and it shall not be. He won't be there. But verse 11, the meek shall inherit the earth. And shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow and cast down the poor and needy. And to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart. Their bow shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken. 
but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. There's assurance. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. See, he's just elaborating on what he said in the first verse. The wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall be consumed, and the smoke shall they consume away. The wicked barreth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as he be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. There's the contrast again. What about the good man? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, here's some hope, here's some reassurance. Here's some consolation. Though he fall, this good man, he shall not utterly be cast be utterly cast down. The Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen God do that. Nor his seed begging bread. The Lord's taking care of him. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. He circles back with admonition number seven, verse 27, depart from evil and do good. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore, verse 27. Turn away from evil and do what's good. And then he goes out a little more and says, for the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. There's our contrast again. The righteous shall inherit the land. That's the third time he said that. And dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom. His tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him. When he is judged, there again is a reassurance. And then number eight, wait, came earlier, and now it's put right up front, wait on the Lord. The idea here is trust him, obey him, rest in him, all the things that have been said before, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, there's the contrast again, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he, pa he passed away, and lo, he was not. Again, similar to the grass illustration here today, gone tomorrow. Yea, I saw him, but he could not be found. Personally, David says, I've experienced this. I've watched this. Now do this. Mark the perfect man. You could make this number nine in your study. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. I think it's part of his development of things he's already said. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. That's why we should rest in him. That's why we should delight in him. That's why we should wait on him. He is their strength in the time of trouble. The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them. Why? Well, because they trust in him. Fret not, neither be envious. Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Commit thy way to the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Depart from evil and do good. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. Verse number 34. Trust and obey and wait for him. Slow down the assumptions, slow down the conclusions, yield up the anxiety, yield up the control and continue on the narrow path for life. Keep his way, verse 34. Don't look for change and haste after resolution, uh, resolution in your own energies. Rest in the Lord. This is a picture of a quiet, peaceful, resigned spirit that reflects Christ. You read the story of Christ. You read the life of Christ. Christ got excited a time or two. But for the most part, look at that testimony. Knew it all. <laughs> Perfect. Living in a sin-cursed world among people he was going to die for. 
what you never see characterizing his life is fret. Fret. He knew it all. He kept talking to his father about his father's will and his father's ways. He kept meeting with the father in the early, early morning. He lived his life in time, but his life was rooted in eternity. Is that not what Paul's saying when he tells us he didn't care if he lived or died? He just cared if he knew Christ. He just cared if he reflected Christ. Paul, again, was a man who called us to contentment because his life was marked by contentment. But because he had come to the realization of some of the things that we have seen today in this psalm. Let's pray together. Father, these are worship texts. And yet they are very instructive. No doubt they are intended by you to wash over our souls and to be used by us to recalibrate where we are. How do we how are we really doing Father, most of our cares do have to do with the things of this world, things that aren't going the way we want them to go, or filled with impatience and strife at times, and assumptions and conclusions and blamings. And Father, we watch our Savior, who knew the heart of every individual that he dealt with, but dealt with them with such love and mercy, patience and long-suffering, forbearance. We are coming to the end of this Lord's day together, knowing that we can't do this. We can't determine we're going to stop fretting. Father, we can take this hymn and this divine standard and take honest looks at our lives and make adjustments. May we do it individually and personally. And may you take these studies that we've had together today and Run them home to our hearts. How sad it is that we would become impatient with you. How sad it is, Father, that we would somehow become jealous of the godless and the unrighteous. How we would clamor after the things that are going to perish when they perish. Things they're clamoring for. How we would slide down into the place of clamoring for the same things. Father, we are very capable of wasting our lives. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would take your holy word and do its holy work in our lives. And may we be a holy people that are testimony of your grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.